Uh, hi everybody. I am glad uh, to see you uh, to see all of you here. And uh, right now I'd like to to share some some details, some some uh, have a short talk about a uh, completable future. Uh, a little bit uh, details about that slide. Uh, probably a lot of uh, already familiar with that slide, but uh, I err in any way, I have to put it. I like that slide uh, really, and if uh, our company didn't have such cute lawyers, I would ask them to do that. Because this slide is my savings. I could bring total crap from, from the stage, and this means I'm not responsible for that. Okay, uh, a couple of words about me. I'm working in Oracle, uh, and uh, my goal in Oracle, my job at Oracle, to make a GDK, Java, machine, Java virtual machine, faster. I'm a performance engineer. So I have to check that it is uh, have a reasonable performance, fast performance, and if not, to fix it. Uh, in any areas, I don't, didn't uh, tie it to particular Java libraries, concurrent stuff, etc. Whatever needs to management or to customer, and this week I'm working on that. So, okay, what we are talking about? Uh, completable future uh, is a very nice class with a very nice features which appeared in Java 8. Uh, unfortunately, uh, completable future itself wasn't used in any other parts of Java 8. It just, just exists, and that's all. I try to understand how many people around star started using that. I did some short uh, survey on a Twitter asking how people are using completable future. You could see results, and I want to ask you about that. First of all, please raise your hands uh, who is using uh, completable future in your code. Cool. Who uh, is just play with that? And who do nothing about completable future? Guys, I, I just want to you, I'm sorry, I won't tell about completable future. I, I, I'm trying to explain performance tricks, performance thinks how to use it faster, and I have no time to explain uh, the huge details about completable future itself, but I hope it will be, be visible. And again, yet another question to that guys who are using completable future in production. Please, uh, who is uh, satisfied and happy with that class? And who is not? Okay, please come to me after the session, or maybe in uh, Q&A questions. I want to talk, I want to collect feedback about that stuff, really. You could see that less than uh, half of uh, answered people are using completable future now. I try to understand what's happening on GitHub, just try to, to, to make a search on completable future, and we could make uh, conclusion that adoption of completable future is not very big, but it increases increasing each year. What we have new in Java 9? First of all, uh, I'd like to say that in Java 9 we already have usages of completable future inside our libraries. It's such libraries like a Proz API, and the most interesting part is a new HTTP client. Uh, most of results, uh, most of performance tips which I will give you, it's not a something that I just invented. It's a practical, a practical things which we found when I was working on HTTP2 cl uh, client performance. So it's a practical findings. Maybe I lost some ideas, but they just didn't appear on that. Okay, a couple words about new HTTP client which appeared in Java 9. It's a new API which should cover uh, both HTTP 1.1 and HTTP 2 with new API. Unfortunately, uh, this client is not a part of Java standard yet. Because of uh, it was a lot of discussion and arguing about API, and we decided to put this client into Incubator. Incubator is a new feature. It's some kind of sandbox where 
a new API will leave for some period of time and after that we have only two choices. We will have choice change API and standardize that or we could choose to drop it, drop off completely. So for GDK9 HTTP client in the incubator. That is why it's quite important for us to get your feedback and to change and improve that existing API. Anyway, you could uh, download GDK9 and play with that. I won't uh, tell uh, about HTTP client. I just will try to concentrate about asynchronous requests because of it's a goal of our discussion. So uh, in your HTTP client, we have two ways to send requests. It's a synchronous on blocking request and asynchronous. How they look like? Uh, synchronous or blocking requests looks very simple. We are preparing requests, do, doing send and waiting until our HTTP response arrives. We are blocking and that invocation of method send. After that we got completely final finished response and could extract all the information which we need from that. And also uh, the client has uh, the other method, send, send async, asynchronous. In that case, uh, we don't block uh, in that invocation. We just return completable future of our response. And somewhere we could do that future whatever we want. We could just block on that future to wait results, or we could attach the chain of action and process them. So, and the other thing which I want to emphasize for our HTTP client is the ability to set up the executor. So in general, we have a lot of a lot of options to make a client, blah, blah, blah. What, what's required to, to do proper work with the HTTP protocol? Even to choose below, you could see version HTTP2, the new standard. But uh, as I told, we are providing two methods, blocking method and asynchronous. And if we have a synchronous method, we should, we should somewhere do that execution because of our original method is not blocking. And in order to provide a user, it's an API, it's not a standalone application, some control of our execution, we should have ability to set up external executor because of end user could narrow or expand that area, whatever you need. Okay, uh, what I will think about uh, blocking and asynchronous API. Particularly, I will think these two kinds of methods. The first method, which is doing something and uh, returning complete result for us and asynchronous which is uh, doing nothing at the moment of invocation and return completable future. I won't talk about different kind of asynchronous providing callbacks etc. It, it's out of scope of that discussion. Just let's talk about completable future. Okay, uh, the question is do you really need both such methods simultaneously? What do you think? Yes. But I just want to show you the following. The, the one thing is the following. It's, it's very easy with existing API to convert asynchronous to synchronous invocation just to do join on completable future. And for the other side, we could make, uh, we, we could take our uh, blocking API and pass to the supply sync method of completable future, it will be executed in some another thread and we'll get completable future. That's enough. So the question is maybe it makes sense just to leave one of those methods and don't explode our public API. Let's talk about that. Uh, first of all, let's consider the first things. If we are implementing blocking API, just having asynchronous API as a base, basic stuff. It's the whole uh, three lines which we need to make our blocking API working. Will it work? Yes, exactly. It will work, but let's uh, think how it will work. So what we have? We have a set of user threads. User threads, I mean it's threads of user environment where we call methods of our API 
And because of it asynchronous, there is some executor where we should do useful work. And we are doing useful work in that executor. And, uh, of course, uh, such kind of transfer from one thread to another and back, it should cost. Let's just, just check how, how much does it cost. Let's do some execution. I did its relative uh, chart. I have three execution, uh, 100 nanoseconds useful work, 100 microseconds useful work, and 100 milliseconds useful work. It's a blue line that is taken by 100%. And orange, it's our overhead of transferring that execution to asynchronous API. And for the first line, 100 nanoseconds, I have no place. It should be this, this orange line should be passed here, 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 and there. But it looks like for a quite large uh, part of execution with large blocks like 100 uh, milliseconds, 10 milliseconds, even 1 millisecond, it doesn't matter how we execute it. Uh, okay, let's check later. Let's check when I do execution of two threads. In case of uh, some stations, the overhead is increasing. And let's do execution of four threads. I know, I did execution on that particular my laptop, which I'm, where I'm showing your presentation. It's a Lenovo ThinkPad, blah, blah, blah. It's Haswell. It has two pure cores and two hyper threads. So we, we generally have four hardware threads for our execution. And the latter case, the latter chart, in the situation when our system is saturated, I have threads the same amount on more than my hardware allows me to do. And in such situations, the overhead of asynchronous execution, even uh, in case of la very large blocks like 100 milliseconds, is, it's already quite visible. That is why I think it's responsible for the first question, why we need to separate asynchronous and blocking API. Blocking API we need when we have to provide maximum performance in terms of throughput, don't do something in parallel. It, it will work better. So, okay. It's some idea. So, transition from execution task from one thread to another thread costs. It's, a, it's quite a simple idea and makes sense to try to avoid it. Okay. Let's uh, talk about the second way. If you have a uh, blocking API, could we easily to create a synchronous API just by submitting our task into another thread? And, and it's a classical way. Usually we have a legacy API when we already have a blocking API and we just want to add a synchronous API. Will, will that work? Let's just change it from our abstraction, do something, and let's back to uh, our HTTP client. In HTTP client, it uh, would be looks like this. I have to say that it will work, but not in all cases. And uh, I'm sorry we have to spend maybe less 10 minutes to explain why and show two cases when it, it won't work. So how a typical HTTP request looks like. We send header to server, we send body, we are waiting header, we are waiting body. It's, it's very, very complicated picture. Of course, there are a lot of other details. What this receive means? It means that we have to wait. We have to wait and block something. Uh, okay, I want to emphasize this. Let's um, check it, how, how it works. We transferred our execution to executor thread and we have to wait. It, it could be methods wait on an object monitor or it could be method await on a condition. It could be a, some kind of blocking queue, but doesn't matter. In beneath of blocking queue, there is a await again. Anyway, we should stop on some wait, wait, and we will stop execution. Our thread is not working anymore. What do we have to do in that case? We, we have to execute somewhere the, the methods which will receive response from our server and the method which will send, notify signal to our await condition and continue execution as that thread. I have to warn about uh, such scheme which I wrote here. Don't do that. Why? In that scheme, I, I send a receive response in the same executor. 
What does it mean? It means in some situation, uh, my executor could be blocked in all threads and I have no place where to process a response and where to wake up. So in reality, I need something more than just user thread, executor thread. I need some amount of auxiliary threads. It could be zero, it depends on goals of your API. It could be a lot of them, but for HTTP client, it's one is enough. Some kind of auxiliary thread which will never block and which will uh, do proper processing of uh, received data and waking our threads which were waiting results. How it works? It's the first part of stuff. The second part. Uh, I showed you the method executor of uh, HTTP client which uh, narrow the usage of my executor, allows me to configure the system. And I think that it's a good idea that if we don't specify some, if we don't put some constraint on that method, it should allow us to our library to work with any kind of executor, more including default executor. Default executor is cache thread pool. Let's think about a little bit about cache thread pool. It just copied Java doc, I won't read it and emphasize it. What's a, a nice thing about cache thread pool? It means that if all our threads are busy, we'll create new threads and our new task will be executed. Cool. But the same thing is a negative, negative thing about cache thread pool. Because of we have to create thread and thread is a resource. It could be expensive. Let's just do some experiments. At the same very beginning, if you try to implement our uh, HTTP request via simple wrapping of existing blocking API, we just at some moment measured and realized, I don't know why, but the single HTTP request generally uses 20 threads. Does it mean that 100 simultaneous requests will require 200 threads? Any ideas? Other than 200 less, more? Oh. Yes. Maybe on some large machine with configuring, expanding stacks, spaces, etc., it will work, but I could tune it for 100 simultaneous requests, but someone will execute 101 requests. Okay, what uh, do we think? How, how to fix that problem? We blocked innovate uh, threads in our executor. So we have to solve it. What we have here? We have a send methods which is doing await and waiting results. The idea of how to avoid blocking is quite a simple. It consists of two steps. First of all, uh, it's a very nice thing that completable future could be considered as a condition. It's only single use condition, but for our goal it's okay. It's the same code as before. It's blocked in the same way as before because of inside join, there is a wait, but it's only the first step. The second step, what we are doing here, we are trying to perform supply sync, send code and somewhere block. Let's uh, inline that and wrap into different set of action in order to understand how it works. We are making chain and here is a chain where we just blocking on completable future. Let's do this. Uh, who knows what method Zen Compose do? Does performs how it works? Nobody. Guys, there were a lot of hands that you are using completable future. How you could use completable future without Zen Compose? Definitely, it's Im almost impossible to do something something interesting without Zen Compose. I will point. Then what does then Compose do? The Compose is a method which perform lambda, function, action, that action return completable future. And uh, then Compose return another completable future which is uh, encapsulate results of our hidden uh, 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 under our previous completable future which were results. Like, like a method flat map in a functional programming. But the, the most interesting part here is that if uh, that uh, completable future is not completed at that moment, we are not blocking. 
We are just, we are not executing our chain of action here. We just finished. It is construction. We are not going to execute this action here. And that means that uh, our threads will be returned to executors if it's read from executor. It means we, we did not capture the thread from execution. That thread, if it's from executor, will do something useful. It, it's key part of that thing. In reality, it's completely eliminate blocking uh, when we use completable future and making changes. It's quite a very thing, nice things. So what we have here? We have here our threads. We are here we are doing Zen Compose method. There is an object, our future. And from our auxiliary thread, we just send in signal complete. It means that when future became completed, somewhere, maybe another thread, we execute subsequent chains of actions and doing what was required. That is a simple results on HTTP client. By simple elimination of all blockings, we got and change, replacing them to then compose, we got 40% of speed up of working with uh, particular our new HTTP client. And this is uh, blocking elimination is the most important things how to make a completable future faster. If, uh, sorry. If you are making chain of our execution, you shouldn't block. If you don't block, our threads will be returned or something else, and that is quite important. Uh, that slide is just, it's just related to performance, it's just for educational purposes, maybe. Uh, then Compose, I told you, it's the most interesting method in the completable future. Just, this example shows you how to make an uh, infinite uh, recursive chain of completable future, if you want. Only with that we could do this. And all other, just, just Google, guys. It's, it's, it's very amazing stuff. Okay, let's move further. Before we will continue our talk, uh, I just want to ask you the following question. Uh, let's imagine I have two threads, and from one thread I'm doing future complete, and from other thread I'm attaching chain of action. Uh, which thread will execute our action? Who will vote for, uh, for case A? B, C, D, how we could execute it from it. The correct answer is that it could be executed either from thread one or either from thread two. And uh, also, that is quite important point. Where uh, the chain of computable future will be executed for our processing. And without understanding that, we can't uh, talk about completable future performance. Uh, it's just uh, some summary. I will, later I will show examples, but here a little bit summaries. I just saying you that if we are using methods then apply, then compose, etc., this action could be executed anywhere. It can be executed from a thread which perform completion of our future. It uh, could be executed from chain construction in, in places where we are constructing our chain. Or even it could be executing from a place when we call get join methods. Here I, I want to show you a couple, several examples, which I did using GC stress. It's some such tools which were done uh, at some times for analyzing and testing some concurrency tricks inside, uh, inside GDK, inside Java. Uh, it's the first example, a little bit about notation. Above, it's a uh, precondition, it's that perform before we executed our threads. On the left side, it's one thread, on the right side, it's another thread. They executed simultaneously, a lot of, a lot of time, uh, times to, to get uh, and to capture all kind of races which, which could get. First example, from one thread we are doing complete, from another thread we are doing chain construction. Below you could see results. It's an exact number of that execution. A lot of action inside uh, construction thread, a lot of like, action inside completion thread. And as an example, what will happen if you do future complete from two threads? 
Who knows what's return type of future complete? Return type of future complete method is Boolean. Could you guess what does it mean? <laughs> the result, there is no result. What? It got the result, so it has no result? No. <laughs> yes. Uh, method complete returns true if that invocation completed future, or return false if that invocation failed to complete future because of it could be raised. Okay, let's make an action. Uh, make an action before trying complete, just future action and try to do completion from two threads. Before I wrote that, that uh, test, I was thinking that uh, it was naturally that action should be executed from successfully completion thread. But it's not at all. It also could be executed from another thread which failed to complete. Okay, the second example. We are, we are just doing one complete and one join, just getting result from our future. And the same, that action could be executed from both threads due to the race nature of that thread. And the third, uh, the last example, because of, I uh, try to be closer. When I have a future and two actions, it's a parallel independent action, I just attach like two chains. And from one thread I am doing complete, from another thread I am doing join. And again, uh, both of my actions could be executed from the single thread or both of my actions could be executed in different threads. And it's an issue. So why uh, we have such uh, weird behavior? Uh, in reality, all methods in computer computer future has several forms, like then apply and corresponding methods uh, then apply sync, where we could specify a particular executor where we want to, to be our action for execution. Why? We, we definitely need it. And uh, to get an answer for that, I, I'm trying, suggesting to compare performance of that. I have a simple chain of two actions, not a lot of. And one chain is doing then apply, it means that we don't have additional submission for executor each time. And another chain is supply sync on each uh, action separately submitted to executor. And here's the performance. Also, because of very different numbers, I'm showing only re relative differences. For small tasks, the difference is quite visible. For large tasks, it must, maybe doesn't matter for our transition. But again, it still exists until our system is saturated. When you have a lot of threads, the difference between uh, the single thread chain and uh, multi uh, executor chains could be different. So the conclusion is simple. We have two form of methods, then something, you know, then something async, by two reasons. Async gives predictability. You have control where to execute your code. But then something gives performance when it will be okay. And also, it's just the same about transition of our execution from one thread to another. Uh, why we need predictability? There is a simple example, particularly from the same area as our HTTP client. We have only one single auxiliary thread. It's called selector manager. It's just uh, really sleeping on new selector, getting notification, read data from network, and dispatch data to particular receivers. Very simple. Okay, how it works? in that situation. We have a future and we have a uh, set of actions. Action foo is action which uh, chained to a future inside our executor, it's our internal action. But after that we return our future to user and our user could attach any kind of action to complete the future. It's idea to, of complete the future to chain actions. So we have chains of actions. If we are doing complete from a selector, what does it mean? It means that we could both actions full and bar execute from that particular selector manager. Why we, we should not do that? Because of, you don't know how much time action full, okay, you could know about action full, you could measure, you could tune it, you could write, but you don't know anything about action bar. 
and it could be any kind of DOS attack for, for your system. You have one important, very important VIP thread and you do a lot of action here. That thread won't read anything from network, the dispatch has a request and the whole activity will stop. So you can't do that. You need predictability, you should avoid such kind of execution here. We, we just can't, from executor thread, make then compose our actions and here they make completion of our action. What have we done? There are several ways to solve that problem. First of all, in Java 9, we got a new method which happened in Java 8, which called complete async. It means that we won't execute anything from our selector manager thread and will complete execution to other available threads in executor. Nice. The same way uh, to solving that problem in Java 8. We are doing complete here, but we know, and by using the then compose async, we protected our uh, selector management thread. That's nice. It works. Right now, we've got really working solution, but it costs. And it costs that if we are, uh, have, for example, already completed future and making then compose, we are making then compose async, and we're doing it from one executor set. We have the same problem. We, we very frequently doing transferring tasks from one executor thread to another executor thread. And that is useless activity. Maybe we could uh, tune it somehow. It's a quite simple trick. Let's check it. If our future done or not done before. And if our future are done, let's do then compose. And in that case, it will be executed directly in that top point from the same thread without any issues. If our future is not completed yet, okay, we are not safe. We have to move into executor and provide such kind of protection, just identity function with a sync option to move it into executor. And that trick, it's not a tip, it's really a trick, but that give for us 16% uh, of execution time uh, for our uh, HTTP client. It's, it's quite a nice result. Just, just, just change, just, just write uh, three lines of code to get 16%. You really can do that. And uh, yet another trick. Finally, we have the following chains of action to our completable futures, like chaining uh, uh, inside of method send async. And method send async is called from user thread. And we are expecting that it will make all details, returns completable future almost immediately from our API because of it should be asynchronous API. Uh, on practice, it realized, yeah, I, I checked it, I did uh, some measurement and realized that in very rare cases, only 3% of requests, but in 3% of requests, when we pass to the last uh, compose actions, we already have a completed future because of server respond for us. We, we got results, but we, we, we have to do some, some other results and process like getting body of HTTP, etc., etc. Uh, if we have for such chain, we have already completed uh, future, it means that the last chain, the tail of chain actions will be executed from user thread. We transfer, but we wanted everything uh, transferred to executor thread, not from, do it from user thread. Okay. We could use uh, then compose async, as I told. User thread will be protected, we will not do in something, but again, it's the same situation, unnecessary switching when we don't want it. How to solve that problem? It is quite a simple idea. Let's do chain of execution, just make a completable, incomplete future at the beginning. Uh, make the whole full chain of our completable future, full chain of actions which we need to do. And only when our chain is ready to trigger the execution, just sending the method, complete a sync and providing value. Void value with the null will be enough. It's enough trigger to execute the whole chain. And Delayed start give us on practical examples plus 10% to asynchronous request. Any questions? Do 
It's quite a simple. I have a future. I, I don't need a result. So I could make a completable future of void. Completable future of void. What's completable difference between completable future of void and completable future of Boolean? Who could guess? How many states I have in completable future of Boolean and completable future of void? What? For completable future of Boolean, I have states complete normally with true, complete normally with false, uh, incomplete, and complete with exception. For void, I have uh, less states. I have incomplete, complete with exception, and complete because of I have no any other values for void than no. But I just want to have complete or incomplete future. I need, need any details here. I, I could use any ca ca kind of uh, type here, but void is minimal enough. He, and the last uh, underlying line, I just trigger the execution because of I completing my future and everything start running. Before that, my chain is protected because of the, the, the topmost future want to be executed. I just construct in the chain. And, and just a simple, simple trick gives me 10% on a, uh, a real HTTP request examples. <laughs> yes, yes. Because of the, the key idea of all uh, asynchronous requests for completable future is not about completable future. It's about threads. The threads is our key resource. We don't need a, a lot of threads and we don't need a a few amount of threads. We need a right amount of threads, usually comparable with the amount of cores in our machine or somehow else limited by our environment. And uh, we have to avoid unnecessary threads. We have to avoid inefficient amount of threads. And we have to avoid unnecessary transition from one thread to another. That's all. And if we delay the start of our execution, we just making for us better understanding where my actions will be executed. To avoid all kind of races and ju just do it. And the, letter, the last trick which I want to show you, it's not related to complete of itself, but uh, I can't hide it, I should know. As I told, the default executor for our HTTP client is cache at pool. Uh, is that a really good choice? Why? No, no. All, after all fixes, I did a lot of execution. It didn't grow more than 100 threads. Anything what I, what I do. In, except of user action, of course, which could block, but it's, it's uh, you submitting that actions. But uh, the problem is that, as I told, uh, it's not really the best thread the best executor for uh, HTTP request. I didn't try to do something theoretical in that area. I just do, did practical evaluation. Because of I have a benchmark, I could execute different executors and check how it works. And for particular HTTP2 protocol, fixed thread pool executor with just two thread maximum gives me the best results. Lately, it's, it's easy for me to explain that because if I know how HTTP2 works, it's limited to writing to network, it limited, uh, because it's a sequential part of which hardly to parallelize. It's limited to SSL encoding, SSL encoding also hard to parallelize. That is why two threads is more than enough to get the fastest. But uh, the right choice of executor uh, could give you a huge difference of asynchronous API and you should check it for your application. Uh, okay, uh, a little bit conclusion. We were talking about completable future performance. And I definitely asking guys everywhere what's the problem, what you'd like or don't like in completable future. And uh, such kind of complaint uh, I am getting for, for many, many times. Everybody told me that completable future has particularly completion stage as a key interface of completable future, has a very difficult interface. A lot of methods, hard to remember. We have four minutes remaining, and I hope in f last four minutes I'll show you how to speed up not completable future, but the Java developer. 
Okay, completion stage. Uh, it has exactly 38 methods. And 36 from this 38 uh, is a duplicated method in three forms. So do something async with the explicit executor, something async without specifying executor, as that something. Let's check it. Something async, it means that that actions which we submit in here, which we are giving in that invocation, will be passed to that specified executor. That action in all subsequent chain. It's, as I show on example, it's quite important for predictability. The second method, it's the same as before, just we are using fork join pool as an executor. It means nothing. And uh, the third method, it means that if future is complete, we will execute action in place. If not complete, it will be executed from other situation, which is much more difficult for combination. So, as I told, 36 method has three forms. What it means? It means we have only 12 methods for understanding fuzz actions. Nine from these 12 methods uh, could be separated in three forms. Apply, accept, run. Also, they have completely the similar behavior. The difference is the following, that apply is taking results from a previous future and providing new results for subsequent future. Accept just getting results from a future giving it to consumer, and no more results, and final completable future has a type void, just show for us that execution is finished. When that completable future completed, this means that our execution is finished. And run. Again, we don't take any results, we don't pro from previous execution, we don't provide any results to subsequent ch chain of execution, we just execute runnable. And these nine methods, it's quite as simple. So we have a single method, then apply, then accept the run. We have a binary OR operation and binary AND operation. When we have, uh, in OR we started our chain when either this input or either this input is ready. In binary AND operation, as usual, we are waiting when both results are ready for us. It's quite simple with these two nine methods. We have three methods for exploration which remains methods. And again, you, you shouldn't forget uh, that all methods before have variant without something, with a sync and another async version. We have another method, three methods, then compose, handler, and when complete. Uh, I already told you a little bit about then compose. You could read something about that later for understanding how to do with that. There are a lot of interesting uh, blogs uh, around that stuff, probably I have to add links, I'll do it maybe later. And handle. Handle is the method which works not only with normally completed future, but with exceptionally completed future. We're just taking results or exceptions as two pair of arguments, pass it to our function and provide new results. And when complete, it's the same as handle, it's accept version of handle. We are taking results or exception, but it doesn't matter which results we will provide. The results of methods when complete will be the same as region. Uh, that's all. And two, uh, there are two methods which, do, which don't have uh, a sync form as exceptionally, which allows to convert uh, exceptionally completed future to normally completed future with some results. And method converts completion state to completable future. From my point of view, it's, that's all. It's not so difficult to remember all methods from completion stage to work with that. Okay, I'm thinking I'm, off, I'm out of time, so do we have any questions? Heads. <laughs>